Okay, welcome back. Um, I sent out an announcement today. I hope everybody got it. Um, I'm concerned just because there's not a lot of attendance in class. It's the flip side of course echo. Although I was talking to one of you today and, and, and uh, he, the gentleman put it very, very succinctly. He said if he watches it at home and he doesn't understand something, he just naps. <laughs> and I think, I think that's absolutely true. I think it's much better that if you do come to class. So we'll, we'll see. Um, Anyway, so we will have a midterm on, on our next class on Wednesday. Um, it, it will be closed, no, uh, uh, closed books, no notes, no calculator. Um, one of the things, that, one of the questions that people have been worrying about is um, the degree to which you need to memorize. And the answer is, yeah, you do need to memorize certain things like Maxwell's equations, uh, some of the simpler formulas, you know, that, 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 that make sense that we've gone over in class. Uh, if you end up memorizing every last little detail, you're doing it wrong. Okay, um, so it's so so if if there is if I require that for example, reflection coefficient at non-normal incidence. Remember all those cosines and and eta's floating around in there. If a problem demanded that, I would give you that on the pro on the test. Normal incidence, I probably wouldn't, because that's a simpler and there's there's a reason there's you know we've seen that several times in transmission lines and in and in uh, you know. Um, uh, plane waves against the surface. So you know that's that's sort of that's sort of a good example of you know where one should be, you know, simple enough, and you'd want it in your bag of, of tools so that you can pull it out at meetings or on airplanes, or you know, um, and 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 those that are just a little bit more complicated that you're wasting time to memorize it. Okay. Um, I think just for you, just so you know, I, I think for the final, I'll allow you to have one page of notes. You'll probably turn it in with the exam. Um, again, for part of the grade. Okay. Um, you'll also have on, on the last day of class we have a homework test, and you won't have notes for that because you will have seen three quarters of the problems before already. You know, on homework. Okay. All right. The material will be through the end of transmission lines. That's uh, the end of class on October twenty second. That's the that's the cutoff date for, for the exam. Okay. All right. I was looking back over the notes. Oh, um, let's see. Oh, the other thing I wanted to. Um, oh, I, I guess a couple more things. Um, I have office hours, as you know, from four to five before my undergraduate class on Mondays and, and, and Wednesdays. I won't have them on this Wednesday for you guys, but I will be around most of the day tomorrow. And so, if you need to get a hold of me with questions, you're more than welcome to knock on my door. And if I'm there, the worst thing I'll do is say come back later. Okay, but but I, if I'm there, and, and, and but I should be around most of the day tomorrow, and I'd be delighted to help, you know, if you need it. Okay, I'll be doing other stuff in my office. Don't worry. But if you are, if you have a need, come see me. And then and then I, and that'll make up for not having office hours, you know, an hour before the test, which just doesn't lead to anything good in my 25 years of, of teaching. <laughs> okay, so. Um, the other thing is, the other thing I noticed is, is um, I, I, I worry that sometimes I'm going a little fast in class, and sometimes I worry I'm going a little bit slow. But mostly I worry about going too fast because, you know, maybe I don't give you time to to copy before I flip the page, and so on. Um, I also, I, and I'm particularly worried about that from the last class because we covered about twice as much material as I normally do. And so, because of because we're leading up into the test, and because we're you know your mind is a little bit elsewhere, maybe last class and this class, what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend um, a fair amount of time today going back over the material that I presented last time, just to reinforce that, and just to sort of think in terms. Maybe maybe we'll see some new things. Um, just give you some time to um, add to your notes or or augment your notes um, as we, as we see it. And if we don't if we don't cover too much new stuff tonight, that's fine because again we're leading into a test. Um, okay. So again, the the antenna problem, as I see it and as I as I frame it, is the sources in Maxwell's equations, the driving terms in Maxwell's equations, the terms that give energy and fields uh, quantities into Maxwell's equations are J and rho, and they are the then they become then the star of the show. Particularly J becomes the star of the show in the antenna. Uh, problem. In other words, when I when I design a when I design a transmitting antenna, when I design the antenna, transmitting antenna, 
the, the design problem is, what is the shape in time and space? What is the shape in time and space of J that gives me the E and the H and the S that I want? Okay, if it's a narrow lobe beam, or if it's a lobe that, that, that floods across half of the metroplex or all of the metroplex, those are, those are the design constraints. What is the, what is the J? What is the shape of the wire? Okay? And, and, and what you do is you think in terms of taking a, a, a wire coat hanger and unfolding it into some bizarre shape and then having current dance across it. And that defines J as a function of X, Y, Z, and T that gives rise, that, that goes into Maxwell's equations that produces H and D and B and E and so on. Okay? And so the, 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 the roadmap that we follow is J, and we find it very, very easy to use the vector potential A. We find it very advantageous to our, our, our advantage to do the J to A transition. And then, once we have A, once we've done that complicated, crummy integral that we'll see as in, 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 um, in, in this class and next, then, then it's just a simple curl to get to a B and an H, another curl to get to a D and an E, and a cross product between E and H to get to S, which generally is what you want in an antenna problem because that tells you where your power flow is going. Is it, is it directed towards the next base, base, base station of your, of your cell phone network? Is, it, is, it, um, is the light illuminating your, your, your cell sample in your molecular cell biology um, experiment in the, right way, in the right manner that will lead you to a Nobel Prize? in chemistry of this year, for example. Okay? So that's, so that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the nature there. And, and the criticism that I fully expect on this is, well, wait a minute, antennas both receive and transmit. Right? They both receive and transmit. And there's a property called the reciprocity theorem that says if I can do the transmission, if I know the shape of the transmission, it turns out that's also the shape that, it, that an antenna uses in, re, in receiving, in, 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 um, in receiving that signal. And so, and so again, it's perfectly valid to take the J to, the, to follow this roadmap, and then at the very end say, oh, but wait a minute, it's, I, it's, I'm really looking for what field, what shape of field will cause J to dance in that manner along the precise turns and twists of my antenna. Okay, so so it's, so from a from a pedagogical point of view, I find it easier to move from J out as a transmission. But then, with the, with the help of the reciprocity theorem, we we have ex we, this exact same solution that gives you gives rise to what a good receiving antenna is as well. Okay, so that's so, so something kind of nice about that. Now, what's all? But also, we we one of we we mentioned that, that the math of this can get kind of tricky. And for that matter, for that reason, like all, like a lot of uh, electromagnetics, we're going to rely very heavily on symmetries in solving, you know, the, these equations, these integrals, in the classroom. But it, so that shouldn't stop you because in in, um, in in practice, you'll you'll do the numerical calculations, and you'll do numerical calculations after numerical calculations. So you build up your intuition, and that's as good as you get to a design perspective, right? In other words. That's the that's, that's real criticism about this problem is we are moving from J to S. So we ask the question, what S do we get out of a given J? And that's completely the reverse of what we want to do as an antenna designer, which is what shape J will give us the S that we want. Okay? And so in this, in this formulation, this analysis instead of design formulation, the best you can do is example after example after example so that you so that you build up your intuition so that you can do some sort of reasonable facsimile of a design. Okay? All right. One of the complexities is, is the um, one of the complexities is is the is the uh, coordinate system that we use. So very important that we understand that. Uh, in general, I'm going to have a, a distributed antenna in other words, not just a single point of an antenna, um, and so and so there has there's some ambiguity about where on the antenna we want to consider the radiation from. 
fact, we want to consider the radiation from each and every point on the antenna, weighted, W-E-I-G-H-T, weighted by the amplitude of the current and how close or far that point is relative to an observation point P. In other words, if you just kind of look at where this drawing is, maybe the current oscillations here arrive at P with a different phase than the current oscillations from here. Okay, so there's both a strength and a phase mismatch, or phase, strength, and amplitude, and phase contribution from each and every one of these dV prime um, components on the on, uh, volume elements on the antenna. So I pick an origin that's off the antenna and away from an arbitrary observation point P. The vector that connects my origin to a point on the antenna is my R prime vector. And the point that connects my origin to my observation point is my, cat, is my little r vector. Okay. And then the point that connects, the vector that connects the point on the antenna to the observation point is the physical capital R vector. And we see that we can get to P by either going directly through R or to go R prime to capital R. So we either have a direct flight or we have to, we have to change planes in Atlanta. So that's that's that, that that's the that's the that's the two, that's the thing. So R is equal to R prime plus capital R. Okay. All right. Now we wanted to go. We want to go from J and rho to our vector to our potentials. Remember we and we and we and we looked. Remember De Lambert's equations that we derived to. The, the, the gauge that you guys are probably all stressing out about right now because you worry that that's going to be on the test, and it may, right? So, 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 so the, those, those, those equations, we want, we, want, we want to figure out how to get to A. And so there's, there's one, one way we decided to think about it was this, uh, this sort of intuitive or heuristic uh, approach, building on what we knew. And for a individual charge, and again, this goes back to TJ's very nice second lecture about, about, about assembling charges. If I have a Q and the, 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 the voltage or the voltage potential or the scalar potential from that is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. Okay. Turns out we go back and we use this um, later on as well. A point, short, a point source of charge makes for a very good delta function. Okay. So, so there, there, there's that. If I have a sum of charges, then I have to weight by their charge, amplitude, and the distance to my observation point where I'm interested in my scalar potential. If I have so many charges that it's easier for me to consider a continuous field of charges or a continuous distribution of charges, then the summation becomes an integral. And notice how I shift carefully in towards the R prime, dV prime coordinates, and the capital R coordinates to find out what V is at the observation point at R. Okay? So the, here's our first manifestation, won't be our last, of the coordinate system that we just, we just concocted. Okay? And similarly, Similarly, if we want to make the leap from rho to charge, then we, we, we change the material property that we're of, of interest, and we keep the capital R and, we, and the R prime and the R associated with it. And notice, notice in this, this, this equality is okay because I'm not letting J change as a function of time. So these are for steady currents. These are for steady currents. Circuit theory, adi adi adiabatic um, approximations. If things time vary, if things time vary, then we're tempted first to put time into each of these current and moving current distributions. So the naive inclusion of time is just to put a time here and a time here and say, okay. 
But that's, as we thought about that, we realized that these electromagnetic disturbances, these electromagnetic fields, these plane waves, these traveling waves, these spherical waves, whatever the way phase fronts are, they move through space, the phase fronts move through space at a foot a nanosecond. A foot a nanosecond, which means after any kind of a distance, we have a lag, a noticeable, measurable, easily measurable lag from the antenna to the observation point. In other words, if I shut off the antenna, energy still arrives at the observation point for some number of nanoseconds afterwards. Okay? So in other words, the response at P is delayed or retarded by a certain amount. And the certain amount is the distance, speed, the speed distance. And so we adjust, we adjust our, our formula. And again, this is a heuristic, it's a hand waving, it's an intuitive derivation. It relies a lot on common sense and we may get some of the details wrong. But it turns out that we have it. It turns out that, that, that um, uh, by cheating a little bit and looking at where we're going, um, we're able to find the vector potential at r and at some instance of time t as an integral from a j that occurred a certain number of nanoseconds ago at t minus capital R over v. Okay? So t minus capital R o o over v. And notice this is where the complexity of this integral comes from. This is where the complexity of this integral comes from that I have, in my argument of J, I have a capital R dependence, and in my denominator I have a capital R dependence, and R, capital R, has an R prime in it. So R minus R prime is equal to capital R, so I have a very complicated um, uh, integral to do because I have all these funny relations, funny manifestations of R prime floating around in this. Okay? So for that reason, for that reason, um, this integral becomes, and I'll use the term um, carefully as well as humorously, becomes very convoluted. Okay? So we see we begin to see this, we begin to see this term, this this um, this integral as the convolution between a forcing term and some other, some other, um, some other functional dependence. And that makes sense, that other functional dependence makes sense if we think in terms of solving these differential equations as solving a set of force differential equations where we have the impulse function response of a delta function, that's the homogeneous response, to an initial condition or a, or, a, or a boundary condition convoluted with the natural response of the, of the or rather kind of convoluted with the particular, the particular shape and, and, and time dependence of the antenna. Okay. So, so this T minus R over V, this T minus tau term here should ring a bell as a convolution term. Okay? So even though we didn't come at it that way, it's, it's um, with a little bit of focus, a little bit of thought about the interpretation of, this, of, the, of the form of this, of this integral, it's, it's buried in there. Okay? Now, we can do the same, we can do the same um, derivation, I'm sorry, rather, we can get to the same answer or, some, or a very similar answer um, with a lot more work and a lot more rigor um, by building on these, on, these, um, on these delta functions. And so if we go back to our roadmap, J to A to, to the magnetic field to the electric field to, to S, that means we start with the Lambert's equations. Okay? And I've, for the most, I've written both of these down, but for the most part what we really care about in, in, in antennas is this equation here, the equation for the vector potential A. Okay. If, we, if we know A, everything pops out. V, 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 can, v is there as well, it just goes along for the ride. 
it's just there for it's if it becomes more complete solution, but we don't really need it. We can get at it any number of ways. So if we look at this, we have a Laplacian here. We have a second derivative in time. This is our wave equation, and this is our forcing term. And the first thing we decide to do, and by, and by no means is this the best thing to do, but it's a very common thing to do. It's a very old-fashioned thing to do, and it's, and, it's a, and it's a great place to start, is before a transform, uh, the time dependence, at least, of, this, of, these, of, these, of these equations. And the way we do the Fourier transform, we could do a couple different ways. We all know what the Fourier transform of d by dt is, right? Psi omega. So, so the a, a, a differential operator becomes a product of a frequency, i times frequency, if we Fourier transform it. Or we can say, we can substitute in e is equal to some envelope in, in space multiplied by an e to the i omega t. And then the c to the i omega t does the Fourier transforming of that d by dt by pulling down that i omega and then another i omega. Okay? Notice that if we, we don't have to talk about Fourier transforming at all, we do because we're electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, but we're, elect, you know, we're, 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 we're engineers and so we, we're, we have a handle on, on, on this terminology and we should use it. But if we don't, we can just say, well, we're solving partial differential equations subject to, and we do that always, we, we try to do that with separation of variables. And so this is a, an A of R multiplied by a capital T of T, where that capital T of T is just a good guess for a harmonic substitution. Now the problem I have with this, and, and it's, it's a very, it, it's not a negative against this, it's just, it's just that there's more work to be done here. And that is, we are now solving for our antenna, as soon as we do this, we solve, we're looking for antennas that work at one frequency. So we're, we're sort of moving away, when we do this substitution, I think, we, we move away from broadband and spread spectrum kinds of, kinds of designs, okay? And so, and, so, and so what we really, you know, one of the things that we really kind of need to get comfortable with, and I don't, I don't have a good answer for this, I, I'm, I apologize, is, is we, what we have to do is we have to figure out what's the same manipulations that gets us towards a spread of free, uh, uh, gracefully towards a, a wide spread of frequencies. Same way that we did, the, remember we did the uh, transmission lines with, a, with an arbitrary pulse and a moving traveling wave component? Well, is there, is there, an, is there an analog here that we can, that we can be doing? And, and most of the textbooks that I've seen, I haven't gone through everything, I'm not, I don't consider myself really, really, really the expert in antennas. I've done a lot of them, but, you know, I haven't really seen a, lot, a, a more graceful way of, uh, most, most of the standard treatments lock you into this, okay? And so I just, I just bring that up because it's, it's nothing wrong with this approach, but I think, I think there's a juicy, you know, area of study. And it may be an exercise of futility, don't get me wrong, uh, but, but, if, but, uh, but, but for some brave and, and tenacious person, um, that, that, that may be something that, that's um, to, be, to be thinking about, okay? Anyway, when you do this and you substitute it in, and, and by all means, I think you should, I, I'm very comfortable with your math skills. Um, that means that you can derive this. You see that we, we, we lose out on the time derivative, thank goodness. We've solved this function with respect to time, and we now have a Laplacian of space. The propagation or dispersion term, uh, A, and then the forcing term here, okay? Notice that, notice that what comes out of the gauge equation is a trivial and nice easy way of going from A to V. So you don't need, this is, this is a, you could use this equation and this equation rather than this equation and this equation if you want. Another reason why we're mostly interested in the vector um, potential equation, okay? So, In terms, of, um, in terms of our roadmap, if I have E, if I have A and I have V, if I have A and I have V, then I can calculate what E is. If I want to use this guy here, the gauge, I can just shove it in. And what I have now then is this is E completely in terms of A. 
Okay? Notice that I'm using primes because this is only in space. Both sides have an e to the i omega t on them, right? So this, this, is a complete, this is a complete prescription for getting an e. And notice what you're doing. You're multiplying by a number, and you're taking a couple derivatives. Nothing can be easier than taking a derivative. If you have, if you, if you have that precious a prime, then, then you should be very, very grateful to be able to do something as simple as a divergence and a gradient of that. Right? That's, that's, that's cake. Right? It's like sliding down. Integrating is like, like hiking up the slope, and taking a derivative is like skiing down the mountain, nice and easy on soft powder. Well, never mind. So this, go, this goes from A to, to E prime. And then similarly, similarly H is, is in terms of A. By the way, I, I, I'm, I'm, I may or may not have left off the primes on this equation. It holds either way. Right, this equation holds either way. If I could put a prime on both sides, that's the equivalent of factoring out an E to the I omega T, or I can, or I can, I can, I, I can leave it as is. Okay, just, just, just so you know. I, I call attention to that because I'm, I'm, I'm always leaving off primes here and there, and I wanted to point out here that it, it's, it's both. Okay. So this, so here's. Here's the generic prescription in terms of how do you get from A to E to H and then to S. Okay, all, all, all pivotally dependent on solving for A, all pivotally dependent on solving this particular equation for A. Okay? And this equation, again, is a partial differential equation with constant coefficients and a forcing term. So the difficulty here is everything to do with this input or this forcing term. Okay? And we solve that using terminologies like particular solutions, or we solve it using terms like convolutions with an impulse function response. Okay? Six and one half dozen the other, but as engineers, as electrical engineers, for most of us, um, we, uh, uh, we, we use that. So what we're looking for is a convolution response. And we know that, we know that um, uh, we, we, traditionally when we're taking a signals and systems course, H, the letter H is used to write the, the delta function response. But we can't use H here because of the magnetic field. And so, and so we, we go to the next best letter, which is capital G. So capital G here is the delta function response. And we use G incidentally because it, this, this approach was championed by a physicist named Green who, you know, um, and so this is called a Green's function. So in the literature, every time you see the term Green's function, you will think it's a delta function response of this, of some form of, of, uh, of this equation or, or something similar. Okay? So we, we have a particular J that's forcing term. We convol we convolve it or we do the convolution integral with, with G. And we find out what what A prime should be, okay? So now what we've done is we've reduced everything into integration integrals. We've now, we've now reduced all of our, our antenna problem into solving one big bad integral and a bunch of easy derivatives, okay? And so, and so again, the whole thinking, the whole thought process is how do I do this integration, okay? And nowadays, it's perfectly reasonable to try to do a numerical integration and do it again and again and again and build up your variations that way. Okay? Um, but the other traditional tricks is symmetries and superpositions, things of that nature. Okay? So, so, this, is, so, so, so this, is, this is the integration that we'll have to do. And by the way, I want, I, want to draw, I want to draw a comparison, or I want to draw at least a connection between this guy here and our heuristic approach here. Okay? So this is A as an integral of J, and this is A as an integral of J. This, or I should say this is A as an integral of J and something else, and this is A as an integral of J and something else. Okay? So, so the heuristic approach, the hand-waving approach that we did to get here, 
we're now trying, we're now looking for a, more, a form and we're going to go, to, we're going to try to get this a little bit more generally. Okay? All right. Um, to solve for G, to solve for G, what we have to do or, is take a look at our system, this equation here, and we have to plug in the specific excitation, which is a delta function, a impulse response, a delta function here. So when I put a delta function on the right-hand side, then the answer becomes G, the delta function response, or the Green's function. And what I've done to be a little bit loose is I've, 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 uh, I've written this constant here as a gamma. And just so you know, this gamma is going to have a real part and an imaginary part. Or it could have a real part and an imaginary part. This gamma could have a real part of an imaginary part. Beta would be 2 pi over the wavelength, the tra traditional dispersion relationship, and alpha flowing through free space, propagating my delta function through free space, or through clouds, smoke, pollutants, glass, windows, so on and so forth, could also have a loss term as well. Okay? So, so, the, so this gamma here is a little bit more... Um, this gamma here is a little bit more general, uh, and, that, and that's another reason why it makes sense to, 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 to fudge and put that in instead of the particular um, case that we have above. In other words, I can, I can take gamma squared and I can set it equal to what I had before, or I can be more general and have a real and imaginary part. Um, so the propagation through the, through the material is found by, by this, this gamma term here. Okay. Now, this can be argued in a couple of different ways. You can be far away from the delta function. You can just recognize that delta function is um, is a, a, a perfect spherical symmetry. And so, if it's perfectly so, uh, um, so, um, so, uh, spherically so, symmetric, as I move around in phi or I move around in theta, I won't have any dependence. No matter which direction I look at this delta function from, it's going to look the same. Okay? It's rather boring that way. Okay? It's just a little sphere, a little bead, a little ball bearing. Okay? And what that means is when I do my, my delta squared, my Laplacian, it means two things. It means that I'm, gonna, I'm naturally drawn to the spherical coordinate system. It naturally always going to be find the spherical coordinate system in these in these um, in these antenna problems, and um, in this particular case, I don't need a del phi dependence and I don't need a, a theta dependence. So if I go and I look at what the del squared operator is in this particular spherical coordinate system, I I and eliminate all the terms with with thetas and phi's in it, I have this equation here. And somebody very bright noticed that if I take d2 dr squared of r times g, multiply by 1 over r, I get this term here. Okay. And so it may be a little rough to go from here to here, but, it, but if you go from here to here, you can, you, can, you can get that. And in fact, that's one thing I think you should do if you leave a little space in your notebooks. You should, you should convince yourself that these two are equal. And, and probably the easiest way to do it is to go from there to there. Okay? When you get there, that form is really nice, by the way. Because then you can multiply both sides. This should still be equal to zero. You should multiply both sides by r. And now you have a d2 dr squared of rg. And you have a minus gamma squared times an r times a g. So now if you say, well, gee, okay, I'll just solve what this differential equation is, not for g, but for r times g, then I actually get an answer. Okay? 
Now let me just let me just point out something that will that will come up in other in other problems. I said if you look at this equation here and you start to look at it, you say that's a um, a second order partial differential equation that's forced with constant coefficients, right? But notice that by the selection of the, of the spherical coordinate system, by the selection of the spherical coordinate system, we, we contradict ourselves, or, or we find a contradiction, or we find a, a complication buried inside of it. That in fact it is, it is that the, the coefficients actually depend on space. So this, is, this, this equation here is a differential equation with non-constant coefficients. Okay? So one of the fun things that will happen, fun in the sense of a challenge and interest and, 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 far, and, 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 and more colorful than, than your, your usual undergraduate equations, one of the things that pops out of these things is, is um, uh, much more sophisticated solution techniques to these, to these differential equations because of their non-constant coefficients. Okay, it comes about naturally from the, from the coordinate system. Okay, but they're well studied and well, well looked at. This, uh, um, uh, you know, these, there, there are something like um, 11 uh, symmetrical, uh, separable systems. There's, you know, you know about the Cartesian, you know about cylindrical, you know about spherical. Well, there's about seven others or, ten, or, or eight others um, that, that have all been enumerated. And over time, um, there were a lot of people that, that, that looked at all the solutions, looked at a variety of solutions in all these different coordinate systems. So there's a big, there's a big history of special function solutions to these kinds of equations. Okay? In this case, this is actually almost trivial in spherical coordinates because of this identification of RG, which means that we can, we can solve for RG, which means that we have, we actually came up last time with a good answer to our Green's function. Now remember this is a delta function that's located at the origin. It's located at the origin, so if I move it away, or if I have a whole field of these delta functions, then I've got to do this R much more precisely, much more carefully. Okay. Now let's take a look, I don't think we did this, this solution justice last, last time, I think we need to look at this a little bit more. There's a strength term. I spent a lot of time worrying about that, and at some point it's just four pi, who cares? Right? But but there's a strength term. But more importantly, there's this one over r dependence and then there's this, this exponent dependence. And you see this exponent dependence has your has your propagation term in it. So this exponent here is that propagation, that plane wave term, or, or in fact more specifically it's a spherical wave term that, 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 that that's this. And, and, and it can be understood in this, in this manner. If I have a delta function, and remember this delta function is oscillating at omega t, right? Because I Fourier transfer, that's the way I, I, I got rid of the time dependence. So I have this little delta function that's, that's cavitating up back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in time. And it's setting up wave fronts, spherical wave fronts, that goes away, that, 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 that oscillate away from that, about, from that source. So think about a fish tank of water and somehow think about, about cavitating or creating a, a pressure disturbance at one particular point in the fish tank well that, and, and have it oscillated on and off so the pressure waves emanate out from that fish tank in, in, nice, in nice sinusoids, but in a spherical manner. Okay. If I get very, 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 very far away from that, then the curvature of that spherical wave front can be approximated as flat, and that's where plane waves come from. So plane waves come from, from being very, very far away, in some sense, from a spherical source or from any antenna, it turns out. Okay. So all the, stu all the study of the, of, the, of the plane waves that we did, it, um, where do they come from? Well, this is... This is, this is the beginning of it. Okay. This one over R, by the way, is this one over R here, right? This one over R here is this one over R here. If I set capital R such that my, or, such that my delta function is at the origin, that just reduces down to a little R. 
right? If I move that to here, capital R and little r become exactly the same, okay? So, so this, this capital R here is this one over R here, and then in addition, this, this retardation term or this, this, this delay term is now manifested in, in terms of this, of this propagation guy, uh, term here. You can argue for that one over R because you have a certain amount of disturbance. You have a certain amount of disturbance, and as you get further away, you're, you're, you're smearing that disturbance over a broader, a bigger, a bigger um, uh, dimension. Okay? Is that, so this one over R may not be clear exactly now, but when we go to S, where we're talking about power, talking about energy, this R turns into something else again, and it becomes very clear what that role of that R is in terms of conservation of energy. Okay? All right, so, so that's our Green's function. And again, three terms. I spent, I spent far and away the most amount of time last time on the, on, the, on, the, on the magnitude, and so I wanted to compensate a little bit for it today by, by pointing out the, um, the other two more important terms, the one over R and then, and then, and then um, the, the propagation term. Okay? So that's our delta function response. That's our Green's function response. It's, a, it's called a Green's function after the physicist, after the man. It's a delta function response because we solved for G because of this delta function there. Okay? That's what led to that G. All right. Just to review, um, we played some limits. And I think it's instructive to, do, to think about these limits just because we're going to be doing them again with respect to other specific types of antennas. So, you know, uh, going to one over, going um, to uh, R go to zero, where the delta function actually exists. This is, we're, this is, a, this is an equivalent. Do you, do you guys remember the sifting property of, of handling delta functions? Some of you do. Most of the people who've had me before. Okay, never mind. Um, this, so, so, so this is, this is, this is, um, this is the equivalent of understanding, of, of taming the delta function by putting it under, a, under an integral. And then looking at, looking at the two terms and finding out what, what, um, uh, what the delta function is when we now are considering it as, as, a, as, a, as a placeholder in volume. And then, and then once we have that, we can solve, uh, we can make a comparison back to the one case that we've already solved, which is a delta function point charge and by putting this, the delta function point charge, i.e. TJ's um, um, work, in the context of a delta function, we can now come up with this 4 pi. So this constant is now 4 pi. And so we now have an explicit um, full uh, 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 expression for our Green's function or our delta function response. The 1 over R, the E term, and then the 4 pi. And I, I mentioned last time, that this uh, this four pi, I mentioned last time that this four pi was um, was a uh, 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 the same four pi that's in that's in the um, the the sphere. Okay, so uh, four pi r squared is a, is a, is the uh, surface area of the of the sphere. Uh, if you divide by the r squared, you get the, uh, a, a solid angle, you get an angle in, in, in three-dimensional space instead of in two-dimensional space. And to distinguish that, we call that angle, instead of a radian, we call it a steradian. So there are four pi steradians in a sphere, and that's where that four pi comes from. Okay? If I have half of a sphere, then I have two pi steradians. If I have a quarter of a sphere, I have... I have um, I have uh, one pi steradians. And if I want to, if I have any particular cone, so, so for example, if, if um, this weekend you go out and you go to that nice, um, you go to a nice ice cream parlor and they, they give you a cone with a, 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 sphere, a, a scoop of ice cream on top, and you want to know the amount of steradians in your cone, well, you take the surface area of, of, your, of, your, of your scoop of ice cream, you take the radius of your of your cone to the cone angle, and you go that surface area divided by the r squared, and that's going to be that's going to be the amount of steradians 
that's, a, that's defined by the cone. Okay? If you find if you find that 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 it's if you find that the um, the spherical top is a little bit hard to make that ca calculation, then what a lot of people do, and this is a, a, a an approximation, it gets you the wrong answer, but it gets you an engineering answer. You take you take the area, the flat area, but you know that that flat area is not right because you get more area because of the scoop of the ice cream as opposed to the flatness of the ice cream. Okay. So it's so anyway so so so, so but, but a lot you'll you'll see that you'll see that engineering approximation made a lot and uh, a you should you should be you know you should recognize it and b you should recognize it as as an approximation so the area is going to actually be a little bit bigger means the solid angles will be a little bit bigger I guess I, I guess I'll digress and talk a, one more thing about that. Um, these solid angles are, are, are important um, from an, in another perspective. Um, you know the time bandwidth product associated with Fourier's, Fourier Fourier um, analysis, right? So the, the, the pulse in time and a pulse in width and frequency. If they're if they're if they're Fourier transform pairs, they're, they're, their product is you know is, is related to each other one over. Well, you have the same kind of you have the same kind of um, uh, one over dependence in in um, the position and the momentum. And so, if you think in terms of your if you think in terms of your your ice cream cone, you have a position and you have an uncertainty in in the momentum of the cone of light that comes out from that. Okay, and so. And so that product, that product together of a, of a, of a, of a, of an uncertain, of a, of a, of an area, and the cone that it radiates into, or the solid angle that it radiates into, that it, that that's called the etendu, and it's an invariant quantity, in the much the same way as the time bandwidth product is an invariant quantity. And so tracking tracking your flow of your energy, the radiance or the radi radiation of your energy. From antenna to antenna to antenna, is what's the size of your antenna, and what's the cone angle or the steradian angle of the of the lobe that comes out of that. And so and so and so and so that if you make your antenna very 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 small, by necessity your cone angle goes up, and you still have your same invariant. So you so you can't you can't have a tiny antenna with a very very narrow lobe. It just doesn't happen, okay. So, so that, so that, that's 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 another that's another reason why this this concept of a of a steradian or the solid angle is actually quite important or will be quite important in in um, in what we're in where, in where we're going with this. Okay. And if I have time at the end of the semester, maybe I'll give a quick lecture on exactly that. Um, see if I'm interested in doing that or if you're interested in listening to that. Okay? All right. So finally, after 50 minutes of, of review, we can now start and, and, and think about something um, a little more uh, specific. We're still not there, by the way, right? We're still not there. We, even though we have Green's functions, we, even though we have this, we still haven't come up with this overall integral for the delta function, right? We're still we're still we're still a fair amount of away away from that. So, what we'll do is we'll do it for one case. We'll do it for the um, uh, the x component, and. Uh, if that's the case, oh, and and, 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 and by the way, I'll, I'll put this at um, I'll, I'll put the I'll put the I'll put my current distribution. Well, here, let me let me just draw. Be easier that way. P. This vector is R. This is R prime. Here's my J, distributed, and this is my capital R. And this is j as a function of r prime. And so what I'm going to have to do, because a is a vector anyway, 
I'm going to have to break it up into, a, into its three components, its three vector components. Now, it may seem a little strange to use Cartesian coordinates on top of spherical coordinates. But remember, when I do my decomposition, I make two decisions. How I'm going to describe where the vector points, and in that case, I'm going to, in this case, I'm doing x, y, and z, Cartesian. And then I'm going to locate my, my vector. And in locating my, 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 my field and locating that point, I'm going to use cart, uh, spherical coordinates, r theta and phi. Okay. So 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 I remember I always I have to make in these types of problems I always make two coordinates, two coordinate um, choices. One for the vector decomposition, the other for the coordinate system itself. Okay. So 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 it turns out that that. By picking X it'll, in a lot of problems, we'll, some problems will start off this way and it, it, it becomes a little bit easier. So we'll do the X component, in which case the, the, the Lambert's equations Sorry, I didn't do this very well. So I've got um, my, my, my del squared operator. And notice that I'm writing this in the prime coordinate system. Because a sub x is, a, is, is um, uh, this, j, this j is at, at, at r prime. And that leads to the right left hand side being in the r prime coordinate system. Now, my Green's function in this case is found in this capital R coordinate system. And so it's e to the minus gamma R, capital R, over R. And then I've got my normalization for my delta, for my delta function, 4 pi, floating around in there. And again, r is equal to r prime minus r. If, I, if I'm talking about what my amplitude, what, what my magnitude is, then I should denote my right-hand side as a scalar. So notice that g of r is actually g of both r prime and r. And that's equal to e to the minus gamma r prime minus r over 4 pi times r prime minus r. So if I write underneath this equation here, What I know about the Green's functions I've got that. Now, what I want to get to is my convolution integral, which mixes j with g. So there's information in the top equation that is the specific antenna that I'm interested in. The top equation says, OK, I've got a j distribution. 
and it's going to give rise at p to an x to an a. So this equation is the antenna equation that I want to solve. I've got this equation here that is information, and this is my delta function response. How does a point on that antenna respond? Sort of an inelegant way of saying that. So what I want to do is I want to mix the information in the top equation, the one we're trying to solve, with the information in the bottom equation, which of, of which I know something about. Okay. And so what we're going to do is something that I think you've seen a bunch of times. I'm trying to remember if we've actually done it in this class. But I'm going to multiply the top of this by g. The bottom of this by ax. And I'm going to subtract the two. We, did we do that on point theorem? Yeah, we, I think we did too. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So we've done, we've, done, we've done that, and for exactly the same reason. There's information in here, there's information in here. I want to blend the two together. I want to mix the two together, and so what I do is I, I cross-multiply, and then I do a, do a superposition. Okay. Notice that if I subtract, I get rid of this guy here. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six terms, I get away with four terms. So, so now what I have is I've got delta with the A, I've got G, J with the G, okay? So this guy is going to sample or sift the A, and then I, I, have, a, I have a mixture or a mixing or a blending or a collision between the antenna pattern that I, that I care about, the antenna distribution that I care about, and the Green's function, G, the delta function response. So this term here is looking very interesting to me. And maybe, maybe, maybe with that introduction to you as well. In fact, if I am looking for this convolution, then what I should do is I should integrate over a volume. There's another reason to integrate over the volume. And that is, the product of a delta function with a, with a regular function can get you into real trouble unless you tame that delta function with an integral. Delta functions just have a singularity, there's their infinity. So while that works out really well when you're off the delta function, when you're on the delta function you have an, inter, an infinity multiplied by, by a function that you want. And you don't want that to swamp out. And so what you do is you remember that a delta function is well normalized when you, when you take the integral. And so you tame this term here with a, by, by integrating. And then you've got some weird stuff going on. G del squared A, A del squared G going on there.
So we'll integrate both sides over a volume enclosed by a surface S. Now, surface some vector field F dot N dA is equal to the divergence of that vector F integrated over a volume where this volume here is bounded by that surface S. And what do we call this? The divergence theorem? Right. There's also another um, piece to this If I have two scalar fields, then by the chain rule, by the multiplication rule, the gradient of, I'm sorry, the divergence of A grad B is equal to the derivative of the first one, which is the gradient of A, dotted with the gradient of B, and then, and then uh, plus A times the derivative of the second term, which is just the Laplacian of the scalar field B. And if I put these guys together, I get something called Green's first identity. So I have a surface integral linked to a volume integral. The volume integral has del squareds in it. B del squared of A minus A del squared of B. I'll come back to a sec. Take a look at the left-hand side here. I'm sorry, the right-hand side here. I've got a scalar field here, del squared, a scalar field there. I've got this, the second scalar field there, del squared, the first scalar field there. So this term here, this guy here, once I integrate both sides over a volume, the right-hand side looks very much like this guy here. So my left-hand side is pretty much the same as I had before. The delta function with A, and then this combination of J and G. And my right-hand side, instead of writing it as a volume, I'll use Green's first identity, and I'll write it over the surface bounded by that volume.
Can you see that? Sorry. Now, we're going to pick a sphere, and we're going to pick a very large one. And we're going to look at what happens to the right-hand side. This equality has to hold, by the way, for any, any sphere, any surface that I pick, right? So if I can find a special case, I can, I can learn something about this. So the special case is when I go very, very, very far away from the antenna. Okay? And I know that my surface area is proportional to R squared, right? The surface of the sphere gets bigger as R squared. Right? And I know that my G's goes as 1 over r, right? Let me remind you of that. My g goes as 1 over r, or my g goes as 1 over r. This guy, just, the numerator just wiggles around, right? So it's, it's always going between minus 1 and positive 1. But it's the denominator that, 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 that damps out as 1 over r. So G's go as 1 over R. A is like G, functionally. If I go very, very, very far away from a complicated shaped antenna, can I discern the shape of that antenna? Not really. Not to first order. If, I, if I'm very, very far away from a, um, from a, a, a can, I can't tell if it's a, a can of Coca-Cola or a can of Bud Light, right? So A, functionally, also goes as 1 over R. Now what about my Dell operator? What's my functional dependence of, of, my, of my operator to my Dell operator? It's also 1 over R, right? If the divergence operator, the, one, the Dell operator, it's dividing through by a length. So these guys, this is also 1 over R. So now inside my brackets, I've got a 1 over R cubed. OK? And I only have a one over r. I only have an r squared to camp to, to to combat that. So the net, the the right hand side, is proportional to one over r. A one over r cubed divided by one over r squared. In fact, let me write that: r cubed over r squared. Sorry, r squared over r cubed. One over r. So as r goes, as r gets big the right-hand side goes to zero. God, that's small. Sorry about that. This guy here, we apply the sifting property, which means we evaluate this function at the location of the delta function, or at r prime equal to r, right? So this term here, we use something called the sifting property. And if you don't remember that, you should look it up and refresh yourself. I I'll, I'll might go over that a little bit in a second. So my left-hand side equals 0, which implies that Ax evaluated at r, that's doing out this integral to get Ax as a function of r. And that's just equal then to that funny mix
And this is, in fact, the convolution integral. This is, in fact, the convolution integral. What we have found is that the response A, due to a J, is the integral of J with my Green's function, which I know, integrated over the volume. And that actually should be the dv prime volume, so that I capture all the antenna. So I know what j is. I know what g is. I specify a j. In this class, I'll specify j's that I know how to do this integral with, with lots of symmetry and lots of simplifications. And if I can do this integral, then I will produce the a. If I produce the A, I can get the AE, I can get the H, I can get S. So this is my magic result. And it's not terribly different from my heuristic response, but we just derived it a little bit more formally. Lastly, this is only for one component. So if I, have, if I get the AY, and I get the AZ, this turns into a vector, this turns into a vector, and I have that. So A, the vector, as a function of R, is equal to mu times the integral of J, the vector, as a function of R prime, G of R prime comma R, D volume. And this, is my convolution integral that describes how I'm going to solve for A in terms of J, which we specify, and in terms of G, which we, we, um, we don't. Now, I have just a moment, so I'm going to very quickly I'm going to very quickly uh, remind you of the, of the um, sifting property. If I think about this, I have some arbitrary function of f of x. If I'm multiplying this by a sharp delta function, then right at this point here, f of x is moving very slowly, it might as well be a constant. So this integral becomes zero all the way out here and all the way here. I can bring that constant through the integral. And that's equal to 1. Okay? I think you've seen that before, and so I'm just reminding you of it. But that's what I mean by the sifting property, and that's what we did here. Okay? All right. We are ready to do some problems. So after your, after your exam on Wednesday, when we come back here a week from today, we will do a wide variety of, of, of examples of this, of this um, formulation.